morning, everybody. Um, are we all right for sound? I'm, I'm seeing nodding. Thank you. Uh, good evening and a really warm welcome to this 20th Burntwood Lecture. Uh, this is the Institution of Environmental Sciences' annual opportunity to address the topic of real contemporary environmental importance. Uh, my name's Julie Hill. I've had a career in environmental policy and politics. I have several hats at the moment, but here I'm really proud to have the hat on that is being the chair of the IES. Uh, and I'm really honoured to be chairing this lecture. I've been to several of these in the past, and I can assure you these are important, um, engaging, knowledgeable events, and you will leave this room feeling uh, much more insightful than you, you joined it, I'm glad to say. Uh, now, I know many of you in the room are our members already, but I know there's also quite a lot of people watching online. So for anyone not familiar with the IES, we are a professional membership body and we bring together people from across the environmental disciplines. And I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure everyone here would agree with me, that that sense of interdisciplinarity is going to be absolutely crucial in addressing the problems we know we're all facing. So we really welcome you all here tonight. Uh, now, I have a list of housekeeping um, observations, which I'm told you must pay attention to. Um, so the no drill is planned. Uh, so in the event of an alarm, we should all leave, evacuate through nearest and safe fire exit, which I think is probably the such way. Um, don't delay by gathering things up. Make your way to the courtyard that you came in by and assembled by Sir Joshua Reynolds. He's quite hard to miss. Um, one of the staff members will come and account for everybody because we have a list and wait in the assembly area until further instructions are received. Uh, and there are a number of trained first aiders in the building, ask a receptionist if assistance is required, and the toilets are down on the ground floor where you came in. Uh, so that's that bit of housekeeping. And then the other very important bit of housekeeping is we are live streaming tonight on YouTube. So if you have your social media open, the hashtag is hashtag Birchwood21, all this one word. Uh, and we would love you to post your reflections and comments and photos. The event's being recorded, so it will be on the IES um, uh, YouTube channel as well. Uh, and just to give you a sense of the overall agenda for the evening, after Professor Hague's lecture, we will have three what we call respondents, which are people from the field, from different perspectives, that we're just going to ask to come up and give sort of two minute reflections on Professor Hague's lecture. Um, and that is partly to stimulate you still further, but also partly to give you a chance to formulate some questions uh, for Professor Hague to answer afterwards. So we are using uh, Slido. I don't know if you're familiar with this, and I think we're going to have a quick test of it. So you can get the Slido app on any browser on your phone. If you're watching at home, you can do it on the computer. Uh, that is um, the entry code. It's quite easy. I've done it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Uh, so we'll have a quick test. If anyone's already on, oh, there we are. We have 100% um, of one person. Um, oh, always a good thing. It has to be said. Uh, but anyway, some, we've managed to test it, so it is working. Um, and you don't have to do it now. You'll have time during the Q&A to sort of log on and, and do it. Okay, we also will take questions from the audience. We have a mic. Um, we'll be taking questions through this medium um, and my IES team will be telling me which ones have been voted up because uh, you can vote the most popular questions. Uh, and so we'll take a mixture from the room and, and from the slider. So it's a great medium to get a conversation going. Okay, so with that, tonight's lecture, uh, I'm sure we're all aware net zero is a concept that runs deeper than any individual or organisation. Uh, and it's an aspiration that will mean a change for the whole of society, for global society, which is probably unprecedented in, in human history. And in support of that goal, IES spent the last year, from last year's Birdwood lecture given by Professor James Scaife, um, right through to tonight's lecture, bringing together environmental professionals around what we've called our stages on the road to COP26. And stages is an acronym, it stands for sustainability, transformation, adaptation, green society, economy and solutions. The, the solutions being obviously the really important bit. We've done more than 20 events, we've, we've released half a dozen briefings, 
um, in pursuit of those science-led, because that's very much what the IES is about, science-led solutions to the, the, the uh, decisions being made at COP26. And at every stage along the way of that, it was clear just how important it was to have that range of voices and disciplines. Again, very much what IEF uh, is at IES's core, that interdisciplinary knowledge and insight. Um, and we're going to continue to use our unique position um, for that interdisciplinarity uh, to work together and mobilise professional membership uh, into the crucial climate action aimed at meeting net zero. So we have a, a big role in this and we hope tonight's lecture will be uh, a big contribution to that. So given that, it gives me huge pleasure to introduce Professor Joanna D. Hay to give this year's lecture. Uh, jo has been co is, uh, was co-director of the Grantham Institute at Imperial College from 2014 until her retirement in 2019. Prior to this, she was head of the Department of Physics. Um, her interests include many aspects of, I'm going, I'm going to term this, how climate change happens, because that list of your expertise, Jo, I have to say, only some of those things did I recognise. <laughs> um, so you will have to explain them to us, how these things happen um, and why they matter, I suppose, crucially. Um, jo, she, jo has published widely on these topics in the scientific literature, and among many other roles, she served as president of the Royal Meteorological Society. She's been a lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and you may well have heard Joe on the media as a commentator during the COP26 negotiations. So when we sat down at IES, we thought no better person to give this year's lecture on the theme of the meaning of net zero. So Joe, over to you. Well, thanks for that um, introduction, Julie, and um, it's a great honour to be invited to give this uh, main lecture at the IES. I, I appreciate it. It's an honour, and I've seen the list of people that have gone before, and it makes me sort of a bit nervous, but anyway. <laughs> so when Julie suggested that I give this lecture, and it was to be on a subject that was sort of scientific, but coming out of COP26, I thought um, net zero is the thing, because so many people are talking about it, but if you go into it in any detail at all, you find actually people aren't quite sure what it means, um, either in terms of its definition or what it means for um, what we should be doing an, an action uh, post-COP. So that's the, uh, the, the, the basis of my lecture. Uh, I'm going to start off with a bit of physics, because I can't avoid it, I love it, so <laughs> anyway, I think it's relevant. So this is the basis of the Earth's energy budget, and um, what it's showing you is the, um, I think, the energy coming in from the sun, warming the surface, surface gets warm, emits heat back, and 90% of that heat gets absorbed in the atmosphere uh, by greenhouse gases, and then they emit the heat back out and back down again. So this is the greenhouse effect. Um, and if you increase the number of greenhouse gases, the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you warm the surface. That's the basis of um, warming. That's a perfectly natural process, but if you increase them artificially, you can artificially warm the surface. And this is uh, my, my only physics slide, don't worry, um, and it's showing um, the impact of greenhouse gases um, on the infrared radiation, the heat radiation, leaving the top of the atmosphere. And each gas is given a different colour. And it's, it's a lovely piece of, <laughs> of science because it's showing you that, that water vapour is the biggest greenhouse gas effect but it just happens to have a gap in its spectrum, if water vapour is in red, here, and this light blue is carbon dioxide. So uh, isn't, it, isn't it extraordinary? The carbon dioxide happens to fit in where the water vapour isn't doing anything, which means that the carbon dioxide, which is actually a smaller component, can actually have a much bigger impact when you start increasing um, its concentrations. So that's the background to um, greenhouse gas, uh, gases and radiative forcing of climate change. Um, and if, so that's the natural atmosphere, but if we look and see what's happening with the warming, this is from um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which I'm sure you've heard of, but the sixth assessment report which was released earlier this year, and it's showing the contributions to warming of the different gases. So the temperature change um, over this period has been uh, 1.5 what's this, observed warming, yes, 1.1 degree, and the... Um, these are the contributions of the different gases. 
And carbon dioxide is the uh, biggest one, and then there's methane is the second one here. So what's happening with the carbon dioxide? And we've got a measurements that going back in time. And this, this is a very simple graph, but it comes from a rather wonderful website, um, Global Carbon Atlas. Um, in this talk, most of the things that I'm going to present are from other people's um, compilations of data and presentations and a huge number of uh, wonderful organisations that have done these things. And I, I hope I've um, represented them all on the slide so you can pick them up and look at them more afterwards. But this is showing CO2 emissions, so the, the CO2 that's being emitted by different countries. And what we've got here is the OECD countries, which going up till about 2008 and then sort of flattening off, perhaps even coming down a bit. But the non-OECD countries coming up here. So the net effect is to a continue an increase. This is the emissions. If we look at the concentration of CO2, there's this rather scary graph. Um, this is from a uh, measurements on a uh, 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 Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. It's very clean air and it represents the global concentrations of CO2. And you can just, it's going up and up and up and there's no actual suggestion that it's flattening off at all yet. So let's just hope it starts to change soon. So that's the CO2 going up. Now at the background to um, the whole concept of net zero so we want to relate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the temperature rise. And this is based on a, a paper by Miles Allen et al. back in um, 2009. And what they plotted then, this is the most recent uh, version of the same figure, but what they plotted was cumulative CO2 emissions. So that's, you add up the CO2 that's coming out every year, add it up, add it up, add it up. And because CO2 has got a very long lifetime in the atmosphere, that's essentially what's, what's gone into the atmosphere and staying there. And they've got that against the global temperature rise, global surface temperature rise. And this is the black is the observed measurements. And the colours are all uh, results of uh, computer model simulations. And the, the simulations take different assumptions about what the CO2 is going to do into the future. They all run till the year 2050, but the blue one has lesser emissions. And the pinker one up here has greater emissions. And so obviously the, the one that's got greater emissions has got a bigger temperature increase by the time it's got to 2050 than the lesser emissions one. But the intriguing thing about this plot is that all those coloured lights essentially lie on top of each other. So what that's telling you is if you want to restrict the, the temperature to any particular value, you need to restrict the CO2, the accumulated CO2 amount to a particular amount. And that's such a simple thing to understand. So you want, if you want to get your temperatures stopping at 2, you need to stop at this cumulative CO2 amount. If you're happy with 2.5. But either way, whatever temperature you choose, you've got to stop. Because if you don't stop, the temperature will carry on rising. Very simple. So there we are. That's it. Uh, and all the discussions around um, um, net zero and things are really to do with stopping. So this is from the um, IPCC's 1.5 report. That was um, global pathways which limit warming to one and a half degrees. And um, what this is, is as a function of time uh, to 2100, of all the scenarios, they ran the models loads and loads and loads of time using different scenarios on CO2 emissions and other um, greenhouse gas emissions. And these, the blue ones, are just the scenarios which produced um, warming of less than one and a half degrees uh, by 2100. So you see um, these this blue ones here, they peak at about 2020, they go about 50% of that by 2030, they go to zero by 2050, and they're negative for the rest of the period. And they have to be negative for the rest of the period because the other greenhouse gases, which are over here, particularly methane and nitrous oxide, don't go to zero. They're reduced, um, but there's still ongoing emissions of those gases. So the CO2 has to go negative because you can, you can suck that out of the atmosphere. We might get time to talk about that later. Um, whereas the other greenhouse gases are, are, are continuing. So um, what I'm going to talk about in a bit is the difference between net zero for CO2 and net zero for all greenhouse gases. So if you want to get negative, you need negative emissions, essentially sucking it out of the atmosphere. So 
well, how does net zero defined? And, and of course, it's very easy to think of it just defined. You've got to put in as much, you take out as much as you're putting in. But the question is, um, is it all greenhouse gases or just carbon dioxide? And which emissions are you talking about? And this all comes down to the scope of the emissions and the source of the emissions. And that's not quite so important when you're talking about global averages, but it becomes very important when you're talking about individual organisations or countries or businesses. Um, so you, you'll hear a lot of uh, organisations saying they're getting to net zero, but you don't know quite which net zero they're talking about. And that applies to nations as well. So one way of um, doing a, a sort of cumulative value for all the greenhouse gas emissions is the CO2 equivalent emissions. And this is the CO2 emissions, which would give, which would result in the same warming as the greenhouse gases in your, in your given scenario. Um, and these are often calculated from the global warming um, potential values. And the GWP is the amount of warming that gas produces over a given time period, and it depends on the time period, taking account of its lifetime relative to the same mass of CO2. So it, it's typically that you use a, a lifetime of 100 years for this global warming potential. And so methane, which has got a lifetime of 12 years, has, is a much stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. But if you put a kilogram up now, um, it will have mostly gone by the 12 years' time, whereas the CO2 is just hanging around essentially forever. Nitrous oxide has got a longer lifetime. And so in this 100-year GWP, methane has got a value of 32, and nitrous oxide has got a value of 280. So if you take account of the different gases in these scenarios and add them all up according to their global warming potentials, you then get the CO2 equivalent. And that's what you want to get to net zero. And this is horribly complex. It's two pictures shoved together, but I'll, I'll tell you what it's about. So um, this is the date of net zero, depending on how you define it, it in order to limit emissions and uh, limit, limit warming to one and a half degrees. So we've seen already on that previous plot that you need to get net CO2 to um, zero by 2050. Um, but net zero greenhouse gas is later because that's when the CO2 has gone negative and the other gases are still continuing. So it's a later date. This plot down here, which I'm not going to go into at all, is just to make the point that depending on all these different definitions, you get different dates. So uh, when we talk about one date, it's, it depends on how you define um, the CO2 equivalent. There's a lovely paper by Fuglestrat of it if you want to read more about that. So this brings us on to the uh, nationally determined contributions, which is um, what countries are committed to. This idea was first introduced at the COP meeting in Paris in 2015, and it changed the whole way the negotiations were done, because in previous COPs, this is the Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, should you not know the treaty, um, that they, they, it's always, the discussions have always been around how are we going to restrict people, how are we going to make countries do less, emit less. And this turned it around so that the countries would come to Paris and say what they would do, their offering, um, to uh, say what their emissions reductions would be. And that was the basis of, of the um, successful conclusion of the Paris talks, which ended in an agreement. I mean, we might think now that the agreement wasn't enough, but at the time it was quite a remarkable um, success. So, for example, at the moment, the uh, UK has committed to reduce um, its total greenhouse gas emissions by at least 68% by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. So that's a fairly precise definition of what it is. Other countries will be less um, precise. And if we look and see what these NDCs mean the global um, temperature. Um, this is again as a function of time, um, and this is like the green one I showed you before, which is going to get them to uh, get the temperature to below one and a half degrees C. This is only going out to 2060 now, so it's, it's got to about net zero. Um, this is two degrees. Um, this is what we get if everybody does their NDCs. This is before this is before COP26. So you see, actually, um, it's a bit of a gap <laughs> in what we need to do. And this has become known as the emissions gap. And if we look at 2030, there's, there's quite a lot of analysis of, of the emissions gap between what's being promised and what's um, 
actually taking place. So this is a, a more of a, a detailed analysis of the emissions gap um, up to 2030 now. Um, what needs to happen in the green, what's, um, what the Paris one was restricting us to, which is that's the level up there, and what the new ones, um, November 2021, has um, dropped it by that. This is from Climate Action Tracker. You can go, go on their website. Um, so it, it looks a bit um, disappointing, um, <laughs> but at least it's come down a bit. Um, and these, this is what's happened. These are what the countries did, um, because I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. I'm not going to dwell on this much, except to say um, this is the difference between the t September 2020 and November 2021. USA did a lot. Um, EU did a bit. Brazil went the wrong way, etc. And this is from the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit uh, website, uh, net zero emissions rates, and they're looking at the different countries and where they are in terms of their commitments and what they're actually doing about it. So there's two countries that actually already achieved their ambitions. These countries have got, um, including the UK, have got something in law. So the UK has got something to get to net zero by 2050. These countries have got proposed legislation, and these ones going down is over 150 of them on the whole list. They've got something obviously getting sorted out and there's some at the bottom that really haven't done much at all so we can keep an eye out on what's going on. Now this complicated picture is all to do with where the emissions are coming from and, and what gets counted for what. So if, you, if you're uh, doing the whole globe as I say it doesn't matter too much but if you're trying to assign essentially assign blame or responsibility then you need to see um, where it's coming from. And most of the, uh, all of the um, United Nations commitments are done in terms of what's called territorial emissions. So that's what's coming out of your country. And here we've got the UK um, territorial emissions. And uh, um, what, what economic sectors are they associated with? But of course, some of the um, uh, energy and other carbon heavy activities in the UK economic sectors rely on products that are coming from abroad. So we're actually importing carbon from other countries. And so we would be responsible for that carbon because we're using it. And if you add those together, you end up with what's called consumption emissions. So we can see that for the UK, the territorial emissions before 60 in 2017, the consumption emissions were 772. So if we're going to start um, assigning blame or responsibility, we really need to take account of where the carbon is being um, used rather than where it's being made. Um, and here's a graph of, um, this is uh, consumption emissions, or both consumption emissions and territorial emissions, um, gigatons CO2 per annum as a, uh, as a function of time here, for different countries. So the EU here, solid line is the territorial emissions, the dashed line is the consumption emissions, which are larger, as we've just noted, for the UK. But if you look at somewhere like China, because they're exporting such a lot of goods that's using a lot of carbon, so their uh, emissions from China are huge, um, quite a large amount of that is actually being exported, and that's contributing to these countries going up, they're coming down. So again, you have to be very careful when you're ascribing blame and responsibility. And then another point to be made, of course, is that China looks huge, but if you do it per capita, um, China and the EU are pretty similar. Right, well, moving on. So I talked about the 2030 emissions gap. That's this one here. But if we look and see um, what's happening by 2100, so if we look at the, uh, the policies that were already in, in action, it's going to get us to over two and a half degrees. Um, 2030 targets, 2.4. If everybody did their pledges and targets, um, it would get to 2.1. And this one here is called the optimistic scenario. I'm not quite sure this is from the Climate Action Tracker quite what goes into the optimistic um, scenario, but it means people are going to do more than they've even offered already. So uh, you might get to 1.8, um, which of course is, is much better than we were at three degrees a few years ago. So it's much better than that, but it's still not down to, um, to one and a half. But it, it looks a bit better than, than this sort of big gap here. They sort of converge as we go longer in time, if everybody does what they say they're going to do. Now, um, I think I'm going to run out of time, so I'm not going to have much time. 
I'm, oh, good. <laughs> she was threatening me beforehand. <laughs> you've, got, you've got too much material, you've got too much material, so I've been racing through it. Okay, I'll relax now. <laughs> At least 15 minutes. Oh, good. Okay. Good. Right. So, um, so the CO2 plots I showed before went um, negative um, after 2050. And the question is, what does negative emissions mean? It means getting the CO2 back out of the atmosphere again, um, which is easy in sort of theory or in principle, not so easy in practice. So this plot here comes from a Royal Society report a couple of years ago. Um, uh, as I say, this, the negative emissions are needed in nearly all of the one and a half degree pathways. Um, and there's various different uh, approaches to doing the negative emissions, which are categorised here according to um, essentially the medium that's doing the um, absorbing. So you can use plants. Um, so if you uh, grow forests um, and you can get that to come down. And here's the land store. So this, this is where the CO2 eventually gets stored. Um, so you, the land store is um, essentially accommodating the carbon dioxide that's being absorbed out of the air into the trees. And there's other um, equally um, biological ones habitat restoration. So, for example, if you're restoring peatlands and that sort of thing, that will suck CO2 out of the air and store it um, in the land. So it's sort of based on, on natural um, processes, although you do find people saying, we need to, well, of course, we need to plant more trees in order to um, suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. There's various variations on this. So this one here, which is called BEX, that's um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. The idea of this is that you grow plants that are going to be used for fuel. Um, you burn the plants to create the energy, but you capture the CO2 as it's um, being burned or as it's being emitted from that. And then you turn it into some other um, storage mechanism, which will come down here and get stored. So you've got your energy and no carbon emissions. Um, there's other um, methods which are not so biological. So this one over here, um, DAX, this is direct air carbon capture and storage, um, where it, it's sucked out of the air and um, either, well, it's, there's various different ways that can go down here, either into geological reservoirs or even into the built environment, so perhaps with low carbon concrete. So this is what you hear about uh, industrial CCS. You hear about uh, where power stations put capture equipment close by their emissions and suck the CO2 out of the emissions, and then they need to do something with it. So it needs to be um, liquefied or solidified, and then it's got to be put somewhere essentially forever. Um, and this has been uh, demonstrated to, um, to be plausible. And indeed, the Norwegian oil company is actually doing some of this and putting the CO2 back in some of the places where the um, oil has come out of, or gas has come out of, under, under the seafloor. There's also a very nice paper, well, a nice paper, interesting paper that came up relatively recently where they're actually um, remineralizing the CO2. So that really is, then it's in a solid and you don't even have to shove it under the sea or anywhere else. So um, that's interesting. But none of this has been demonstrated at scale. Nowhere near the scale that you would need to if you were really going to do all of the all of the um, emissions that we're currently doing, get it back um, out of the atmosphere. Um, there's others in here, um, enhanced weathering of rocks. So um, you can put silica minerals and you spread it on the ground and they can um, absorb some of the um, CO2 and then they get become part of the soils. Um, and that's another way of storing it. And this one over here, which says nutrients at the top, I think this one is, maybe people know more about this than me, but I think this one's gone right out of fashion. This is where you um, sprinkle these chemical nutrients like iron and things on the oceans, and that encourages the plankton to um, grow, and the plankton take CO2, and then they die and they sink to the bottom, etc. Um, but I think um, recent tests on this idea have shown that it's actually really not plausible at anything like the scale, or even at all, that would be needed. So. That's included for completeness. So this is all, um, uh, you, you need it, but let's need it less, please, because <laughs> um, 
it, you can see it's not it's not nothing's easy none of it's going to be simple and so that it's much better to stop the emissions in the first place rather than relying on the on the negative emissions so this brings me on to the topic of offsetting which is uh, directly related to um, negative emissions and the idea here is that um, a polluter pays another party to take on additional mitigation activities and then the the polluter can can gain the credit um, several points you made about this if you just take it um, at face value it um, has no effect on carbon emissions at all because you're just moving the emissions from one place to another um, but it's the basis for the oops sorry it's the basis of the um, carbon markets and emissions trading schemes where um, for example uh, in the UK and the EU the emissions trading schemes has a cap so everybody all the people who are party of this um, activity have a cap on their emissions and it declines every year so there is a net um, decline um, but it's uh, there's, there's a lot of um, voluntary schemes used um, so you know you can um, buy a flight and then the airline company says oh you can offset your flight and we'll plant some trees for you um, and they may plant the trees maybe they will but you know they can't carry on doing this forever there's not enough places to put all the trees let alone if they're the right sort of trees and they're not taking the land use away from somebody who needs it for food or other things so there's all sorts of issues around that um, and you do um, hear the phrase greenwashing which is where it's often applied to companies but it could also be applied to countries too um, where they're they're making their um, activity look less carbon intensive than it really is by passing it on to somebody else so if you've got a, a, a poor country that's uh, selling its um, carbon to a, to a rich country or, or the other way around whichever way it be <laughs> so the poor countries um, having to take on the responsibility it can then not do things that it might do otherwise on its own carbon emissions so it's it's really doesn't seem very um, fair let alone anything else uh, so this is about what happened at COP26. Now, I know that several people here were at COP and they probably got their own opinions. Um, beforehand, um, I was really worried. I thought it was looking um, quite like it might be really bad <laughs> for various reasons. Um, partly because of COVID, of course, and everybody's eye being off the ball. And partly because of the political situation in the UK and we're meant to be leading the activity. And you're thinking, oh my God, what is going on here? And is, is anything going to happen? Um, as, the, as the meeting went on, until the beginning of the second week, things were really looking, wow, this is amazing. Uh, they're actually going to get to a, a, an agreement on um, zero carbon dioxide. It didn't quite happen in the end. Um, uh, quite as good as that but actually um, there were a lot of good discussions and here's some of the good things that happened up here um, so I'm not going to go into all of these in detail but um, first thing was to um, update commitments in a year's time so previously under Paris it was been every five years that the uh, the agreement would be updated but this is you've got to do it again in a year's time come back with your improved ambitions and tell us about it what you've been doing and what you're going to do better in the future um, agreement to end inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. There's weasel words here um, because it's not an end to fossil fuel subsidies, it's an end to inefficient ones. So you can have what you like, which are inefficient or not. Um, there's doubling of carbon adaptation finance, that's good. Oh, and this one was important the Paris rule book. Um, so that was a, a lot of discussion about the emissions trading schemes and. Um, there's something called double counting where one country would sell it to the other country i'm not getting me buying and selling the wrong way around but you can imagine both countries count the co2 reduction it's double counting so this is um, a way of avoiding that um, the agreement on deforestation the pledge on methane um, so sort of middling good things the agreement between usa and china well that's good i mean um, india What's the next zero target? Um, but of course, it was the US, it was um, China and India that were really causing the problems with the next zero CO2 agreement at the end. And then here's the bad things um, no commitment to phase out coal, only to phase down. Here's some more weasel words. Um, 
and the world is not on track for one and a half degrees we've seen it's 1.8 if you're if everything goes better than you might think and they're still not up to the, the target set in paris uh, for a billion dollars per annum to the poorer countries to do what they need to do um, there was no agreement to compensate countries for loss and damage. It was a, it was a, it, there was a discussion about it, and previously the rich countries had just said we're not going there at all. So it is sort of actually getting onto the agenda now, which is good. So um, mixed bag there. Um, then in the UK, we have the Net Zero Strategy, uh, which was published uh, last year, oops, um, in, in October. Um, um, and it, it includes several things that had already been announced by the government over the last year or so, but it's also bringing all those together. It's covering um, pretty much every economic sector, what they should be doing, and to a large extent, how they should be doing it. There are, there are, it's not entirely that, for example, it's very weak on the agricultural sector, um, and it doesn't always say where the money's going to come from, um, but, the, but the whole, um, the whole document and, and the, um, sort of the wording around it and everything I thought was was quite positive. The people, I'm looking at the front row here, who know more about policy than me may have a different opinion, but I thought it was quite a, a good document. And this is um, analysis by Carbon Brief of what's what's in this strategy. Um, and this is, each of these is um, a different sector. It's quite difficult to see the different colours, but um, what their emissions are in the equivalent CO2 as a function of time as you go um, forward to 2040 and this is the negative emissions at the bottom here so um, that is coming from the government from base um, and it's now up for implementation it's the implementation now that's the real the real issue how are they going to do it so talking a little bit about businesses I've talked about countries um, of course you hear a lot of um, discussions about what, what companies are doing for their um, carbon footprints um, and what's happened in, in the UK now is that um, Sunak has um, implemented um, mandatory climate disclosures so this was originally the idea I think came I don't know it came from him but he certainly brought it forward from was Mark Carney when he was governor of Bank of England that um, firms should announce what their risks were from climate change they would have to uh, declare their climate related financial risks so climate disclosures uh, the idea being that if um, investors could see that a company had really big risks from climate change, they then might move their investments elsewhere. So it would be helping to move the system towards where it should be. So this is now going to be implemented for the largest companies. Um, it's going to be mainly on energy companies and aviation companies. Um, it comes into force um, April next year, and it's going to affect initially 1300 of the UK's largest companies um, which is great because you've got all those really people you know important people in big companies who's thinking about these things not just in a scientific perspective but also what it means for finance and money and business and all the rest of it and if they can think about it that really will bring everybody else along you've got something like this is the science-based targets initiative which is a setting corporate standards that businesses can use to, to help them set their um, set their targets. This is um, a nice picture. This is from um, colleagues at the Grant Committee. I want to acknowledge um, Yuri Rogeld here. He is um, the director of science at the Grantham Institute, but he's also very um, important in uh, the, the uh, IPCC. He's lead author. Uh, he's led the 1.5 report and all sorts of things, and he's. He can think it with such great clarity, and many of the talks I've had with him have led me to think in the ways I'm showing today. So this is all to do with corporate emissions responsibility. So it's a little bit, well, it's the same thing, really, as what I was talking about before, as the territorial emissions and the consumption emissions, but this is for individual companies. And they divide the emissions into um, scopes. So um, the scope one is just the um, energy that you're using in your own business, essentially, or emissions that are coming from your own business in in the country but then you've got scope two which is imported electricity which has got a carbon footprint and then there's all these at least things scope three which are upstream and downstream into um, your supply chains and what happens to the 
uh, goods once they left your factory. And so um, when you're talking about net zero strategy, you need to say what is what is covered. Is it scope one? Is it scope two? Is it scope three? And scope three is by far the largest, probably for most companies, of where their carbon footprint lies. Um, well, this is um, uh, something that's done by Zero Tracker, and it's looking at the the world's largest publicly traded companies. Here's their uh, annual revenue starting at the top with Walmart and coming down, and how they're doing on the whole. Um, uh, climate change car decarbonisating agenda and you can see that they've been given traffic lights um, green is good and red is bad <laughs> but the, this lot are all reporting annually on what they're doing that's good um, but you see for the other columns they're not so good and a lot of them are using carbon pre credits i.e offsetting um, to get to where they want to be so that's a bit of a bit of a worry and also they haven't got a detailed plan and they haven't got scope three so, you know, so far so good, but definitely not good enough yet. She says we've got five minutes, I think I don't need five minutes. <laughs> um, in case anybody's uh, going to try and uh, organise their own um, outfits, here's some useful resources. These are very helpful websites for um, information on how to decarbonise smaller businesses, larger organisations. NEDs and uh, education sector and schools down here. That's just a list. And um, finally, I've thought this up, which is the Grantham Institute's nine things you can do about climate change, as it were, um, yourself personally, which I think are important. And I know it's not it's not going to be hugely effective. You know, if I I have stopped eating beef, but it's not that's not going to affect decarbonisation. Um, but I think it, it, it's the talking about it that's really important. So I say I've given up eating beef to somebody and they say why, and then you, you enter a discussion and then hopefully more people enter the discussion and then they tell their local MP, actually, we think it's really important that something's done about climate change. And then we build up a groundswell um, and it gets back to um, Parliament or, or the MPs or whatever and they'll actually do something about it. Maybe they will. Let's hope. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry to put you under time pressure, but it, it worked out perfectly. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, and we're certainly just filling the last one there, aren't we? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. So, I'm going to ask our three respondents to come and join us um, on the stage. Uh, of course. Um, Gwen Buck is Senior Policy Advisor at, at the uh, NGO and Think Tank Green Alliance. Um, Gwen works in the politics team to engage MPs on climate change science and policy, uh, which must be um, quite a bit of work. Joseph Moog in the middle is a uh, policy leader at IES, and he's been leading uh, a lot of that work on the stages to pop that I was describing earlier. Um, and Philippe Pernstitch is a senior consultant at the Carbon Trust, so he helps companies to measure and reduce their carbon footprint, amongst other things. So, so perspectives, yeah, exactly as Joe was saying, from the industry side, uh, from us as a professional body, and from the think tank and politics side. Um, so can I turn to you first, and, and the, the role of respondents is to say what has really struck you about Joe's lecture, you know, what's new, what's, what's interesting, and where does it take us? Um, yeah, absolutely. And actually, if I can, just immediately on that thing behind me um, and that idea of what we can do responsibly, um, something that I've been thinking quite a lot about is our role as citizens, because often when it comes to climate change, we're seen as consumers. And I think it's really important to remember that we're also citizens um, and we can be active citizens in our communities um, getting engaged in groups and all that kind of thing. So that's just like a quick response on that on that previous slide, because I think that's that's really important to remember. Um, so I work in the politics team of an environmental think tank um, and so I do a lot of day-to-day -day engaging with MPs um, and I think one of the things that um, really struck me in the presentation just now um, was this idea of um, yeah, how to define net zero and what that really means. Um, and in my engagement with um, MPs, that's definitely been um, a question that's come up a lot um, from parliamentarians, from government, and how they can respond to that. 
Um, but I think it's also really important to remember that um, in the UK we're very lucky to have um, a cross-party consensus on acting on climate change. Um, that isn't a given. Um, there are countries around the world where that isn't the case. So um, things like the fact that the Climate Change Act was brought in by the Labour Party, um, but the net zero um, target was amended um, by the Conservative government. Um, and there is um, sort of party, well, there was sort of party manifesto pledges on net zero. Um, but I think really that sort of drilling down into exactly what it means um, is really important. And at Green Alliance, um, we've been thinking a bit about um, carbon offsets, as Joanna was talking about, and how those, it is just an unregulated market at the moment. Uh, there is no government oversight. Um, so we've been um, pushing the idea of an office for carbon removals, which would, which would have sort of that oversight. Um, and, um, you know, also something that Joanna mentioned was um, the net zero strategy, the fact that there isn't uh, there isn't a strategy for land use and agriculture that really feels like a missing piece. So um, whilst there's loads of government ambition, when it comes to the actual policies that have been put in place, it just hasn't reached the mark. So we've had the government's 10 point plan for green industrial revolution, uh, Green Alliance, we've sort of stepped up the numbers and it just doesn't add up. Like we don't get to net zero if we implement that. Um, so there's so many policies missing. So I guess just a reflection from me thinking about it, Joanna's slides politically, like there is that ambition there, but now it's really all about action and what we can do to make net zero happen, whether we call it net zero or absolute zero, um, going forward, it is sort of moving into that action phase now. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, it, it did struck me while Joe was um, talking, we hear so much less about the negative bit about the taking it out than we do about what we should all be doing at home and how our diets have changed. So yeah, um, absolutely agree. Um, Joseph, so for those of you at, at our organisation here tonight, you know, we have environmental science to to mobilise. You know, what, what does Joe made you think about in terms of where we can go next? Yeah, thank you, Julie, and thank you, uh, thank you, Joe. Yeah, so many things to, to take away from that. Um, I think for me, it's it's pathways um, because we know there are happier endings. We know there are sadder endings. Um, we know how to get to a lot of them, and we know that we need to stop uh, talking and start walking, as it were. And I love hearing scientists speak about issues which have so much gravity to them. It's it's not just the science, but it's the scientist, as it were. Um, because I think the idea of, of dispassionate science portrays reality that it is, in many ways, a very human and a very emotional endeavour. It's that uh, discipline of discovery, of, of seeing the future in it and uh, seeing it with all of its promise, but also all of its uncertainty at times. And from that abstract and statistical to very tangible and real consequences for, for real human lives, um, it, it's about the expertise and the insights of, of scientists uh, collectively and individually, and the choices and knowledge uh, that can expose in our lives, real choices, like, like you say. Um, and that speaks, I think, to an important truth that we all need to reckon with in, the, in our own lives, which is that in the days to come, the choices we make will be um, historic decisions. And um, no matter how small they feel to us at the time, and they will shape the uh, pathways we take, and they'll shape the uh, world that we end up creating. And it is our imperative, as those with the power to create historic decisions, that we recognise as we do the fragility of the future that we're creating. Uh, we need to go beyond what's come before. Uh, we need to uh, go beyond the simplest possible responses that we can think of. So it's not just people, but whole societies. It's not just ideas, but solutions. It's not just science, but scientists. It's not just change, but transformative change. It needs to be about sort of real people, the lives that they lead, and um, it needs to be something that's positive and meaningful to them. Now, the IES has its own perspective on what that might be in, in our back. Yes, yeah, it's that uh, lovely cushion that you've all got on your seats that grow thin. Um, but I, I don't want to talk too much about that. Um, instead, I want to leave you with, uh, with this, which is that there are actions that each one of us can take in our day-to-day -day lives to make a difference. But beyond that, environmental scientists have the privilege of a little bit more power than that. 
and a professional body like the IES can collect that power and clone it into a very effective tool, a united voice of science scientists and, and the natural world. But in order for that to work, in order for that to happen, we can't just speak, we also need to listen. And so my takeaway, my one thing for you this evening to, to go and do is, is to join me in that joy of listening to scientists speaking about issues with a lot of gravity to them and um, be ready to listen to that and think about how it can affect uh, the future of the world that we're creating as well to this. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and transformative is one of those, it's such an easy word to say. It's quite a difficult thing sometimes to envisage. Joe, I'll perhaps ask you to say a bit more about that, you know, in a bit. You know, how do, how do we start to envision the, um, you know, what transformative change looks like? Because I think we all, we all say it, but can we describe it more? more accurately. Um, so Philippe, you work with a lot of companies, so you're at the sharp end of where things are difficult and where there's difficult trade-offs between maybe wanting to do the right thing, show the right face to the world, genuinely reduce, but a, a business imperative as well. So what should, what should strike you about what Joe's laid out and what, what that might mean for businesses? Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Joe, for that. Uh, it was, um, yeah, really interesting. And I, I was also going to actually um, uh, highlight the pathways, the, the fact that obviously we're talking about net zero, but it's not just about the end goal, it's how, how we get there. Uh, and, and, and that is important. And, and in thinking about that then is, is um, the, the, the sort of respective roles of um, governments, national governments um, and, and businesses um, uh, and, and uh, the balance between the two. So, so we've seen obviously a flurry of, of um, companies announcing net zero targets, as, as, as you've highlighted, and and yes, very confused at times in terms of you know net zero carbon neutral etc. being used interchangeably um, when when they are different different um, concepts. Um, so and and obviously um, businesses setting those net zero targets can't do so so in isolation they still need the the um the infrastructure regulatory and policy drivers um that, that have to come from from governments um to to enable the the, the private sector to succeed um and and with that um announcement of, of net zero targets um uh, Joe's already uh, has also mentioned the the risk of greenwashing, uh, and, and and that is a very real um, risk. Uh, I, I think it's it's very easy to to announce the the targets to some sort of um, benefit from this this uh, green halo for a while, and it's good, um, good and, and and yeah, and um, so so it's it's very important to to. Um, put systems in, in place to um, hold the companies to account that, that set those targets. And I mean, sort of with governments, we've got in, in the UK, we've got the Climate Change Committee doing exactly that for, for, to government um, and, and, and doing it, it quite well, uh, I think. And, um, and at the moment, the, the Science-Based Target Initiative has, has been a great driver to get companies to engage with that and make those announcements but that initiative stops at the target setting it, it defines how you set the targets um and, and and what those targets should look like what the trajectory should look like um but it, it doesn't go beyond that and and, and so uh, i think the next step that, that we will um see is is uh initiatives to um measure to to um, ensure that the companies that have set these targets are actually have got the plans to implement those and are on the trajectory, are meeting that that trajectory and meeting those plans. And and so that at the Carbon Trust, for example, we we are just launching a route to net zero uh, standard certification, which is kind of going to to exactly that um, help companies to to demonstrate that they they are walking the. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I thought one of the most interesting things, Joe, was your reference to the role of finance in all this. Mark Carney, the Task Force on Financial Disclosures, 
you know, if, if financial flows start to change, I'm sure that will certainly sharpen the need to, to have a plan. Um, okay, well, we'll open it up to Q&A, and I'll go to the audience first while we're um, grappling with the Slido. I'll, I'll take one of those in a minute. But um, can, I, can I open it up for questions from our audience here? We have, I think, a roving mic. We have a roving mic. Mm -hmm. uh, so would anyone like to ask the first question? Just a specific example of the patient. You see the very quality management. Specific question about companies. What about tax house stations, firms, or if it's regarded as the new and it even gets a subsidy for us? And uh, the other example would be nuclear power, and no private company will go to a nuclear power station because of the risks of the uh, waste disposal, both of which I think are dodgy. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> should we should we take a few questions and then come back to you? Any any others in the room before we go, Lady? <laughs> yes. Uh, how can we reconcile uh, uh, net zero with uh, other uh, sustainability uh, projects? That's a big question. Um, there's a lady here, um, and then I'll perhaps ask Joe to do some responses, or uh, I'll let Audrey come in. Yeah. I actually come into the side of the first on the screen because I've been saying a bit more. Sure. Um, I was wondering, we see a lot in the media about people in retirement who are afraid of what should they should be doing individually. And I feel it's almost conscious a lot of responsibility on the people who don't necessarily know how to deal with it. Is this focus from downwards to individual action in the red cherry? Think about the same things. Well, there's some very big questions there, <laughs> so I'll let you. I expect uh, the panelists can help me with some of the answers, but anyway, I'll. I'll if you would like to help you, please <laughs> come to yeah. This is your, your lecture and therefore your QA, but if you would like them to help you, <laughs> we, wonderful expertise. We, we, we can certainly yeah. bring them in. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so, on regard with regarding to the um, the power stations, uh, wood fired or nuclear, of course, those are, those are two different issues, um, both controversial. Um, I think the, the one about the Drax and the wood chips is particularly um, difficult because, I, as I understand it, the wood chips are shipped in on fossil burning ships from across, <laughs> across the Atlantic um, before they get burned in the power stations. Um, if, if Drax is doing carbon capture and storage, that would be a little bit better. That would come under the BEX heading, but I'm not sure that they are at the moment anyway. So I don't think that's, I don't think, I don't think biofuels is, is the solution to all our problems. Um, nuclear is something different. Um, there's all sorts of issues around nuclear. So, of course, in a sense, it's not producing CO2 as part of its process. So it is, it is a green fuel. But there's a huge amount of um, CO2 that's generated in actually creating the power station in the first place, all the concrete and stuff, and also uh, when they're decommissioned. Um, so that's a, a consideration. Um, the other thing is that if you're choosing different sorts of energy, um, nuclear energy tends to be extremely expensive compared with other sorts. So why would you do that when you can have a nice wind turbine instead, or a few wind turbines? <laughs> um, but as I said, people like to comment on energy at all. <laughs> we'll, come, we'll come back to you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so on the circular economy and net zero, I don't think there's a conflict there at all. In fact, I think you can build it exactly uh, so that the circular economy is doing the green stuff at the same time as, I mean, it is, circular economy is, is doing the green stuff as you're moving the waste around, moving the food around, moving the water around so that everything is feeding into everything else. So I think that's that's not a, unless I've misunderstood the question, I don't think that's a, that's a conflict. Um, and then there was a question about personal responsibility. I, I, I agree with you, and when, when I put up that, the nine things you can do about climate change, I tried to say at the start, I thought, this is good, but it's not, it's not, and I know people, the, the other side of that coin actually is people think that because they put a few things in the recycling, they've done their bit, um, which I'm afraid is going to, done a little bit, 
They've done a little bit. It's got to be what the Prime Minister touched. They have they've maybe yes. done a little bit. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. But so um, I do think we have to take the pressure off individuals, uh, and, and it certainly you know could, could, shouldn't be used as an excuse for the government to do less because it thinks that people can all do it in their back gardens. Um, on the other hand, if you decide to um, that you want better transport and you're lobbying your local authority to get you cycle tracks and you don't want polluting vehicles in your area, that's going to have an effect on the on the CO2, as well as on, as on your health. And actually, while I'm on the topic, <laughs> um, almost everything that you do to act on climate change is also good for your health. I mean, the active transport is one. The less particulates from power stations on your lungs is another. The low um, red meat diet is another. So it, it's a sort of positive positive um, spin on it you can put there. Absolutely. OK, I think, should we take some of the Slido questions? It's quite hard to see. Adam, would you perhaps give us um, one or two of them? Yeah, happy to do so. Um, so I'm going to summarise a few of them for you. Um, one technical question about um, ozone wasn't mentioned after uh, one early slide. Why does this get us all blue? Did you say ozone? Yeah. What do we need to address more effectively? Um, and then a question about that kind of link between the commitments made by, by governments on the national scale and then individual cultural behaviour changes. Not understanding how those two things link together. Um, I was at one of my own questions on the use of privilege of covering a lot of this today, so I'll ask But let's um, put aside the question of how we can reach one the Greeks for second in terms of all the consequences. Um, and I was wondering if you felt that we had a good, strong handle on the risks that were involved in, in one and a half degree warming, um, in particular not just looking at kind of physical and biological systems, but also um, social, cultural, food, economic systems. And particularly the kind of concept of key or um, cascading risks. Um, shall I start on ozone? Um, <laughs> I did my PhD on ozone. So. Um, ozone is a very interesting gas. It's a greenhouse gas. Um, and so if you put it into the, um, the lower atmosphere, it will act as a, as a greenhouse gas. And if you put it into the upper atmosphere, um, it acts to um, absorb the UV. So it has different effects depending on which layer is in the atmosphere. Um, and the, the slide I showed with ozone was because it's sitting there in the atmosphere and being a greenhouse gas, and that was the effect it's having on surface temperatures. But actually, if you look at the trends in global ozone, there aren't really any. There's, there's, there is an increase in ozone, in stratospheric ozone, especially in the Antarctic where the ozone hole was. That's because we stopped using halocarbons, which is also good for mm. greenhouse gases. Um, but I don't think we need to worry about ozone in terms of climate change. Um, the second question was to do with the government's um, behaviours uh, as opposed to personal behaviour. Cultural and behavioural changes, I think, wasn't it? It's, and it's, yeah, commitments are being made to make changes in policy. Are there commitments being made to ensure the cultural and behavioural changes necessary? So it, it's all part of the same picture, isn't it? I think um, when you talk about uh, governments implementing policies, they've got to implement policies that will stop companies doing technological things or start them doing technological things but they've also got to change the way everybody thinks about um, how they're carrying on as well so that the mindset is, is this answering the question <laughs> the mindset is um, set in, in the right direction um, and I think you, you remember when we all gave up smoking or at least we were told we weren't allowed to do smoking and um, <laughs> um, and the first thing was that smoking was banned in Irish pubs. And so, oh my God, smoking banned in Irish pubs, how can it be? But it, it was easy, and it was easy because the whole mindset, everybody knew by, that, by the time that the legislation got into practice that that's what was, had to be done. And I think the same thing can happen here. Everybody will understand that not only does it need to be done, but it's actually good for them to do it as well. It should be easy, unless they've been asked to spend lots of money on buying new heat or something, you know, it'll be, it'll be relatively easy. 
Okay, thank you. And Adam, sorry, just to repeat your question. Mm. Uh, it was about the risks of, of 1.5. Oh, yes. Uh, I wasn't yes. quite sure whether you were talking about the risks of not doing it or the risks uh, associated with 1.5 um, so degrees. It's really the assumption that we could have 1.5 degrees of warming and no more. And, you know, do we even have a proper handle on the risks associated with 1.5? Mm. So I think that the, the growing understanding has been over the last sort of decade or so. Um, and you saw I referred to the, uh, the um, IPCC's 1.5 report, and that was about the difference between 1.5 degree warming and 2 degrees warming. Previous to that, we thought 2 degrees would probably be okay. The 1.5 degree report showed us actually 1.5 is a hell of a lot better than 2. Certain things like coral reefs just disappear when you get to 2 degrees. Um, but now we're realising actually every little bit it gets worse. So we've already got the extreme weather, and you can look at it on a global average, but if you're actually suffering from extreme weather in a particular location, you know it's happening. Um, and so I think the message is 1.5 is not, well, it's not good enough. I mean, we need to, we need to do less. We need to do less and less. And the more, the more we know and the more we experience, the more I think we're likely yes. to come yes. to that realisation. Yeah. Um, I can see, see the finance industry question is being upvoted. Um, so the question, uh -huh. the question is, how do you incentivise the finance industry to invest in net zero? And this is one where I thought our panellists might have yes. uh, some interesting contributions here. But Joe, do you have a view on how we incentivise the finance yes, so when industry? When I started in my career mm. as an atmospheric physicist, mm. I never thought in my wildest dreams <laughs> or nightmares <laughs> that I would be talking to business people, <laughs> or worse, <laughs> bankers, oh my god. Um, well, in this context, but, better. Uh, <laughs> so, um, hmm. it is quite extraordinary. If you, if you look at the, the business people, they were, they were at, certainly at COP15 in Paris, but in, in uh, Glasgow, there, there's loads of them there, you know, and because they're canny business people, they know what's going on, they know that they've got to adjust their companies, all they need to do is think about how best to do it and what's in their company's interest and what's the least expensive way of doing it. So I think, I think business companies are well um, on board. That doesn't address the question of finance. Um, I mentioned um, before that the finance for um, helping developing countries is not enough yet from the United Nations richer countries. But if you look at the, fi the the finance that's being raised, for example, in the UK, I think it's part of the, in the net zero strategies, it's something about that bit, um, um, where the, the government has already seen finance being raised because companies see it's in their interest to do it and they can invest in things like um, new green tech um, innovations which will earn the money in the long term. Um, and um, I've lost my thread now, but it, it's, you know, that this is actually one of Boris Johnson's lead arguments is mm. that it's good for business, and, and, and of course yeah. it is. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis in the strategy, isn't there, on the technological opportunity and the things that we will be able to export when, when we've done it, and I'm not sure how that, some of those, the sort of mitigation balance with the um, capture or the, or the um, renewables balance with the sort of negative bit you were talking about, Joe, that really struck me the need to do that and how untested actually most of that stuff still is. Yes, and there um, is a bit of an emphasis on, on carbon capture and storage in, in, the, in the UK mm -hmm. policy document. Yeah. But more, basically more money needs to go into it, doesn't it? So how do we incentivise the finance industry? Um, Philippe, I'll start your end <laughs> and work this way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it is, uh, as you say, I, th I think the, the um, whole... Um, Infrastructure around uh, 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 around um, net getting to net zero is, is sort of gearing towards actually it just making business sense um, and and uh, you know there is no future in coal uh, that that's sort of uh, increasingly clear uh, abundantly clear and um, and and there are those those wins uh, to be had in uh, Technological innovation and in, in investing um, for for um, the new technologies that are going to help us in terms of be it, um, carbon capture and storage or or, or um, uh, electrification of transport, etc. All all of those um, things that, that we need to do. 
um, there are big opportunities. And but I think there's something it's... missing in, in, you know, so, I, mean, I mean, you can imagine a lot of finance people being pretty incentivized by the thought of stranded assets. If we think about what an extraordinary thing it is to say, there is no future in coal. I mean, just that, you know, just thinking about that, how would it help you? So, so maybe it doesn't need incentives. Is, is, is there, is there a... I, I think it it has needed incentivizing because because up until fairly recently the signals weren't sufficiently clear enough from governments that that is definitely the direction that things are heading. I think and and that's where you get this this sort of head of steam building up where it takes incredibly long. I mean I. I attended COP3 and I was horrified to, to realize that this, this was 23, 20 odd years ago. Um, and, and uh, you know, um, since then, it's taken so long. And, and in the last few years, the speed of progress has really accelerated. And I think, you know, we will start to see tipping points in terms of, for example, um, electric cars. I mean, they've been around for a long time now, but but we are getting to the point where, where they will actually over their life be cheaper than, than um, diesel cars. So, yeah, so. I'll, just, just, um, I'll just ask one quickly on this one. It, it, so is, is there a missing incentive? Is there a, if you have a wish on this, that something will really get the finance industry to sit up and notice? And... Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's all about um, government leadership. Um, they need to show that this is the direction of travel. I think things like the net zero strategy were a good way of showing that this is the direction of travel. This is the way that private finance needs to be, um, you know, focused in these areas and focused on decarbonisation. Um, I also think that in terms of like um, financial risk, um, we're at the point where it's so much riskier if you don't invest in this. Um, and I think it was really disappointing um, during the budget with Rishi Sunak not, not really talking about climate change and not seeming to take this very seriously because it's actually the fiscally responsible thing to do is make sure that we are getting to a net zero economy. Um, so I think there is so much more to be done. But I think, as Joanna mentioned, you know, if the businesses were out in force at COP26, um, in some respects they were showing the way um, more than some countries. So I think that there is a good direction of travel, but there's always sort of more to be done and that's sort of like incentive. Okay. Other questions in the room? Straight in here. Mm -hmm. got, so I think the mic's right at the back. Oh, sorry. I think it was, we've got one down here and one at the back. Thank you. Mm. I have no such Oh, I just got it. Oh, I just got it. I just got it. I just got it. I just got it. Really, I was quite optimistic. You are about our actions or the actions that we not take, and we feel like we're supposed to make this talking about the global warming science or the environment. There's a lot like that. Can you run a shadow? All the things in motion. Whereas my personally, I'm quite optimistic view that scientists and engineers and environmental scientists can come up with solutions when that it will happen. But do you share that? Don't you? No. <laughs> should we be yeah. optimistic? Um, well, how optimistic should we be? Yeah, it's difficult to answer that question, and it depends how tired and exhausted I'm feeling and how I feel about <laughs> it, to be honest. Um, I think we can be optimistic, and I think it's not just saying, oh, we can sit back and wait for the scientists to solve it all for us, um, but because the general direction of travel is going in the right way. Now, it may be that certain parties, you know, like China, are going to make it more difficult but China knows it's got to do something and it will do um, and if you're just looking at um, if we are looking at the sort of local thing if you look at the way when well, you mentioned um, uh, EVs and things if you look at the way that um, the cost of um, wind energy has just plummeted and the cost of photovoltaics there's, there's a lovely graph I saw which was you can tell I like graphs <laughs> 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 which was the predicted cost mm -hmm. of um, photovoltaics as a function of the year of the prediction. And it was always behind, and it's always got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, going much faster, because when the, when the technologies are getting developed and adopted, um, it just, it's just self-perpetuating. So I think that's going to happen in a number of different areas. Um, so I think that's a reason to be positive. Um, yeah. 
Okay, we have an interesting one here on the slide note. Um, if CH4 will disappear, dissipate within 12 years compared to CO2's infinite lifespan, does this mean that cows aren't so bad off? <laughs> which source is the sinks to focus on? I think you did quite a lot of that for us and the relative, but how bad are cows? Well, yes, I mean, you could, uh, you could see um, um, how bad cows are because um, of the graph I showed you right in the beginning where carbon dioxide was like two thirds of the, of the uh, contribution and the methane is the next one. The thing is that while um, the, the methane only lasts in the, in the atmosphere 12 years, it's being continuously replenished um, by the cows or, 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 you know, that's not really the cows. Um, and so um, if you act on um, the short-lived greenhouse gases like methane, they'll have a, a faster effect in the near term, and that can be that can be adopted as a good strategy um, to try and get us moving fast towards net zero. Um, but in the longer term, of course, it's it's CO two. Um, I think you need to do the lot. Yeah. Okay. And the thing that's really worrying, surely, is the permafrost starting to melt and yeah. release its methane. Maybe we maybe in the light of the optimism question, we won't go and mention it at the minute. <laughs> Keeps it all under control. Um, are there any other um, questions in the room? One at the back. Um, I think, is there one right at the back and then one just in front? Uh, thank you. Uh, Joanna. Uh, uh, could, sorry, could you say who you are? Uh, Jade Man. Jade Man Um Do you think um, in Britain we waste too much energy? Ah, oh. um, yes. energy must be a big yes we lose so much heat energy yes energy, so um absolutely and if we're looking at the, in the uk i mean the the, the the biggest contribution to greenhouse gas emissions at the moment is transport and, and the next one is is buildings and heating um, and as part of the uh, government's net zero strategy there's a section on what we need to do about uh, buildings and heating and, and um but it isn't actually got much in the way of implementation of a policy to make people's houses more energy efficient. And I mean, I would have thought that was, as you're suggesting, I can't see you anymore, um, <laughs> um, a sort of a bottom line of what, of what we need to do. Of course, if we save energy, we don't need to create so much energy. It's, it's a no brainer. Uh, it just needs some investment. I say just. <laughs> okay. Um, and there was a question just in front, I think. regarding the radiative forcing of aircraft. I mentioned radiative forcing right at the beginning of my talk, and it's really um, when you put something into the atmosphere, how it affects the radiation budget. And if, if it's stopping radiation getting out, you've got a positive radiative forcing, which means you get warming. And the question is, what's, I think the question is, what's the role of aircraft? Now, you can look at the, um, the direct radiative forcing of their CO2 emissions, and they are significant and getting more. Um, and they need to be addressed, and they also need to be included in the um, the budgets because quite often they're sort of shoved. They, they weren't included in the UK's carbon budget, but I think they are now. Are they? Yes, I think they are now. So um, that's good. So it's CO two is important, but I think you might be perhaps there's been a lot of work on um, the effect of aircraft on clouds, um, and if you um, 
right, step backwards, clouds. Uh, <laughs> clouds can have a different effect on the atmosphere. If you, if you increase the amount of low cloud, it reflects sunshine back to space, which is cooling the planet. If you increase the amount of high ice cloud, it acts like a greenhouse gas, so it's warming the planet. So it, it, the effect of aircraft um, is very sensitive to what altitude that they're flying at. And I think uh, the general consensus is that the, their effect is increasing the amount of cirrus cloud, the high ice cloud, and thereby enhancing their warming effect. But in terms of absolute amounts of, of energy, it's, it's relatively small compared to their direct CO2 forcing. Okay, I'm going to, going to take one from the, the slider, and this is probably something our um, respondents might want to come in on. Um, <laughs> governments don't lead, they follow their voters. How we, can we convince more people that climate is something worth voting for? <laughs> I think, I mean, there's, there's lots of messages. One is, one is, I mentioned already the health co-benefits, and we've heard about the business co-benefits mm -hmm. and the, the financial co-benefits. Um, and if people think that it's, it's going to be good for them anyway, regardless of the climate, um, why wouldn't they vote for it? Um, I suppose, you know, we have the Green Party, which is... Is, we took, were talking about Caroline Lucas earlier, weren't we? Which isn't she wonderful? But um, the Green Party is growing, but it, it's still not perceived to be a big party that people will vote for. I think perhaps you know more about this than me, but perhaps because um, their um, policies on other aspects of the economy and society aren't so well known. But it's growing, so there must be people wanting to vote that way, maybe more so. I guess the trick is political competition that Green Alliance was founded on a a principle of generating political competition, so all the parties would want to do well on this agenda. Are we getting there, Gwen? How do, how do we get more? How do we convince people to vote for it to, to actually use their vote on this rather than do the recycling? Um, yeah, it's great. Well, um, a public opinion on on action on climate change is the highest it's ever been. There was an Ipsos Mori poll out. I think it was yesterday showing um, concern around the climate and the environment is is just way up there in the lead. Um, it, it is a real concern. I think that's probably a COP twenty six effect of climate change being in the news a lot more than it maybe has been. Um, and then we obviously saw the huge upsurge of, um, say, like some school strikers being led by Greta Thunberg back in 2019. Um, and, and there was so much um, in the sort of political and like um, media discourse around action on climate change. Um, and as someone who was working with politicians, I did see the huge effect that that had on them. Um, so a few years ago, when you know there was there was just so little political debate, but as soon as these the, this huge sort of upswell of um, active citizens getting involved, you know, literally going off the street or writing to their MP, it did have a huge impact. And you know, we saw way more debates. There's if there's so much more being done in Parliament now. Um, I think directly because of that. So um, I think we are in a really good position where all political parties are pushing this agenda. Um, we might want some to go faster than others. They're going to do it in different ways that align with their political values. Um, but I think also sometimes if you're, um, you know, if, if you're sort of like a hard sort of eco warrior or, or you know you've sort of come from an environmental science background like myself, you you kind of can find it hard to understand how people maybe aren't thinking about this all, all the time. But obviously, loads of people aren't thinking about this all the time. But that doesn't mean that they don't care about it. Um, and I think there's some really interesting initiatives, things like. Um, Climate Assembly UK, which was a huge citizens' assembly, had 100 people, representatives of the whole of the UK, and they were able to bring recommendations to Parliament on what the public wanted to see them do on climate change. There's really, really interesting initiatives about getting the public to sort of give that pressure to parliamentarians. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think there's a lot of insight to be uh, gained from each one's comment about um, citizenship and, and viewing it through that lens, because if you think about citizenship as the means by which people engage in democracy in the first place, you can see that a lot of what's missing at the moment is people having the means to engage in this issue, because it's like one said, some of them want to. But often, as we heard from the audience, people feel like they can't make a difference, they don't know how to make changes happen. And I think the answer to a lot of it comes from things like carbon and climate literacy, the ability to know enough about the background that when you go into the ballot box, actually know how what you're voting for will make a difference, not just to whether or not we do something about climate change, because we're beyond that conversation. 
how your vote for one party or another will make a difference to the pathways on the slide is something people need to feel like not only they know and are comfortable with, but that they can be a champion of, that everybody can go in and feel like it's something that is an active part of their lives when they go as a voter. And part of that is the inherent sort of climate carbon literacy, part of it is broader environmental systems thinking that gets us out of this, this fear we have that we can't change anything because the system above us is so large and complex, but that we can influence it through democracy, through bigger systems in a, in a more meaningful way. Yeah, clear pathway through the complexity, as you say. Philippe, what would what would be your top mobilize way to mobilize voters? Um, yeah, I mean, again, I think it's it's that um, voters are obviously uh, individuals vote for for many different reasons, and and it's it's having um, a coherent vision of a low carbon or net zero carbon future that that um, facilitates all of the other um, uh, demands and, and, and requirements around social justice around around uh, uh, um, you know security um, and, and uh, having jobs etc all, all of those elements need to need to mesh together um, that's that sense of low carbon lives are better lives yeah. We, we, need, we need to promulgate that as well. Okay, I'm going to ask if there's one more question from the floor, and then after that I have one more that Joe is a physicist, you will love, I promise <laughs> you. Um, but are there any more questions from the floor? Because this might be your last opportunity. Yes, there's a lady here. Um, thanks very much for Living on multinational corporation headquartered in one country, but with markets and factories in multiple other countries, where do I actually sit in regards to interests in this country? So are they interested in one country? Are they split between many, or are they in a totally different city? Well, I'm really honest about this at all. I mean, um, I'm not the um, really honest because the emissions trading scheme has now got rules associated with it. I guess somebody is thinking about these things. I mean, do you know about this? I mean, yeah, so. there must be somebody <laughs> thinking about, and there must be some rules that apply, she says, but I don't know what they are. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's two sort of completely separate accounting systems between uh, national accounts, um, uh, and which, which obviously the NDCs are based on, and then corporate accounting, um, which, which looks at the, the sort of scope one, two, and three emissions, sort of your direct emissions, your, your energy use, and then all your value chain up and downstream of, of uh, the, the, the products and, and, and services that, that you sell. Um, so in terms of, of the multinational corporation, it is the emissions, their emissions sit wherever in, in whatever country those are emitted uh, physically. Um, so, so there is currently no, um, no, no sort of direct link between those two, um, and and in terms of the markets, the carbon markets, the the the, the regulated market um, is is part of the um, UN um, framework convention um, between countries, um, or or indeed uh, it, it doesn't have to be uh, under the UNCCC. Obviously, there's the EU ETS. Um, uh, and and that is that that's looking then um, its internal market regulations uh, driven by by companies and the the voluntary carbon market is is really um, driving the the, the, the the sort of um, I guess mainly the communications benefits of of, of companies um, is is engagement, a stakeholder engagement with their consumers. We sounds like a conversation over drinks, which will yeah. <laughs> very shortly. Um, I think this has been the final question. Apologies we haven't got to all of them, but in essence the question is, is there real potential in nuclear fusion? 
I'm going to try and even test it. I, I've, seen, I've seen some of the factories so doing the, the, the magnetic. It's been the same for the last 50 years. It, it will be in 30 years. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's always Having said years that, years there, there are now, um, that has been demonstrated, mm. I think at, um, I forget the name of the lab in the US, um, a fusion um, energy um, experiment actually created more energy out than it put, it put in. Yeah. Um, so it may, it may be that it's actually getting somewhere, but I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's interesting to know from you. It's I, 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 the, phys the physics I know are very basic. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up there. Joe, thank you so much. That's been, you've covered a huge range of questions, and thank you for an amazing lecture. And I'm sure everyone will want to get hold of it afterwards and look at all the graphs and diagrams because I think it gave us huge insight into, into a great deal. Thank you very much to our respondents. That's been really helpful to have you with us. Um, and very much thank you to our organising team, to Catherine um, and the whole IES team who put this event together, which you can imagine is quite a nerve-wracking thing, given we're never quite sure, oh, we're going to be in a room, are we going to be online, are we going to be both? But I think we've actually really successfully done both. So um, great plaudits to you all. Um, and I also need to say a really big thank you to the Royal Society of Chemistry for very generously letting us use this venue, which has been fantastic to, to be in. Um, and we will search you all for books as you leave. <laughs> uh, and so with that, it remains to say, there are drinks and canapes. We have ordered entirely vegan canapes because of the lower carbon footprint and the health benefits uh, for you to eat before you embark on your journeys home. So, so thank you very much indeed and uh, great to welcome you all here. Thank you all. <laughs>